Hey guys, this is David with Average Joe Investing. And I know in my last video, I said I probably wasn't gonna film up here again, but it's a little bit noisy in my house right now and it's absolutely beautiful out today. So I figured, you know what, let's come up here, let's film this one as well. So anyways, today's video, I'm gonna be doing what I was talking about and that's kind of changing this channel up just a little bit. I know a lot of people here on YouTube talk about, you know, if you buy a house, you're gonna pay off this much or whatever. I thought it'd be a lot better to kind of make a little bit of a series here where I show you guys step by step the process I'm personally going through buying a house because I think that kind of brings a little bit more of a connection to it. I can show you guys kind of progress, show you guys, you know, renovating the house and all that once we get to that step, but also kind of giving you guys a personal look at what it's like to go through the pre-approval stage, walking around and checking out houses, talking to the actual realtor themselves, going through the closing process. I think it's gonna be a good idea to go through those processes with you guys. So I'll probably do what I did with the last video. I kind of am gonna break this one down into chunks and I'll put time codes for it down in the description or down in like the top comment. That way, if you guys only kind of wanna see one or two aspects of it, you can definitely skip around the video and get to that part. But again, this series is probably gonna be five to 10 different videos of just the different steps and the different parts of getting a house. So anyways, Let's go into the first one, and that's pretty much deciding where you're gonna go to get your loan through. So the pre-approval process is basically just figuring out how much of a loan you qualify for, but honestly, it goes a little bit deeper than that. So yeah, we're definitely trying to find out, you know, how much money, can I borrow 80,000, can I borrow 100,000, can I borrow 200,000? Because that'll give you an idea how expensive of a house you can go out and look at. But really, it's also important to kind of decide what brokerage or where you're gonna go through to get it. So for example, around here, you have mortgage brokers you can go through. You can go through you know, your small local banks, which honestly, I don't recommend them. Taking a look kind of at our options there, a lot of places are four, four and a half percent, at least out where I live. And compared to kind of the competition, that's pretty expensive. And we'll get into a little bit later how expensive that ends up being over the course of your loan. And then kind of our third option out here where I live at least is going through a credit union. So there's a lot of state credit unions around here. Um, we have CEFQ, we have Visions. Um, there's a bunch more banks kind of like those. I live kind of on the border of PA and New York. So luckily I kind of have the options from both states. Although some of these places can only do refinancing and things like that across uh, state lines. So that's something you're gonna wanna talk to them about and kind of figure out. So without trying to get on too much of a tangent about credit unions and things like that, if you do have a credit union around you, definitely look at starting an account there just because at least around where I live, most typical banks right now are paying five hundredths of a percent in interest on any money you have sitting in the savings account. Most credit unions around here are at least a quarter percent. So again, not keeping up with inflation, but absolutely you're gonna be getting better rates not only for taking out loans, but also better interest rates and just letting your money sit there. So after taking a look at our kind of our options there, my fiance and I decided we were gonna go through one of these credit unions to get our loan. And so just so you know, things you had to bring with you when we went to go for the pre-approval process, you need your social security number, it's a credit check, they're gonna go in there, they're gonna take a look at all your debt, they're gonna take a look at you know any college you have, any credit card debt, they're gonna take a look at all of that stuff. The other things that we needed is the last two years worth of W-2s, as well as at least the last month, maybe the last two months of pay stubs, from everybody that's gonna be on the loan. So in this case, mine and my fiance's. And then the last thing that a lot of people require that our bank actually didn't is your actual bank information. So they can take a look and make sure you have enough money for a down payment and make sure that you're actually financially responsible. You're not somebody who has you know 500 bucks in the bank and now you're taking a look to see if you can get a huge loan. So those are kind of the things you need to bring. And now to kind of the funny part, the reason why I had kind of an issue with it. As I told you guys in the last video, I've hopped jobs a little bit in my life. So over the last two years, I've actually worked for three different companies. So when it came to actually taking a look at my W-2s, they couldn't get a good idea of how much money I make in a year because the only W-2 I had from the company I currently work for only ran from June through December of that previous year. So they don't actually have a good outlook. And not only did it only run six months, I got a promotion in that time. So it wasn't even consistent that way. And then it actually came down to, okay, no big deal about the W-2s. We'll just take a look at your last couple pay stubs. And that brought up even more issues. 
So I work in a job where we make commission. So commission's not something that's exactly consistent. So it's a little bit harder and that's kind of why they want to take a look at your previous year, your previous two years. So they can kind of get a basic idea how much money you make. So I had the issue of switching jobs. I make commission, which isn't consistent. And then on top of that, we're about to hit blackout periods. So I'm using up as much vacation time as I possibly can right now. So I didn't make commission during those times and I wasn't working consistent 40, 80 hours, you know, in a week or two weeks because I was using up vacation time. I was only working 25, 30 hours a week and the rest of it's at your paid time off amount, which if you work in a commission-based job, if I use PTO and I actually work, I get paid at two completely different rates, which makes it very hard for them to actually determine how much money I make. So that kind of caused a little bit of issues there. And so that was my personal experience. My fiance didn't have any of those issues. Um, she works a couple jobs. She's a very hard worker. So, but you know, she's been doing her work for a little bit longer and there's no commission or anything there. So all her stuff's pretty consistent, but don't worry, we'll get into issues we had with her in a little bit because of course, you know, the world's not perfect. We ran into issues on her side as well. Okay, so now we've picked where we're going and we've got all the paperwork we need and we've gone over all the paperwork we need with the people kind of running our credit and stuff here. So next comes the big thing. So obviously they ask how much of a house you're looking for, you know, what kind of money you're looking to borrow. But next comes up kind of the part where they're taking a look at your credit and trying to figure things out. Now, the national average for credit card debt's a little bit funny because they say it's $15,000. But if you take a look at that number, only about 40% of Americans actually have credit card debt. So the average number is actually around $5,700. Now, again, this is one of the spots where my fiance is fantastic. She actually doesn't have a credit card, so there's no issues that way. For me personally, I have a credit card. I have no debt. I always pay it off, you know, at the end of the month. So no issues there in terms of actual credit card debt. But next comes up the other part. So we're looking at debt to equity ratio, which is a very important thing when they're doing these kind of loans, because it's, you know, if you're making X amount of money a month, how much of it's already coming out before this loan kicks in? So for me personally, it's not much. Luckily, I went to a community college for my first two years, and then I went to a private school where your bills started to add up quite a bit. I also had a lot of help from my parents. I'm not gonna lie about that. They paid for my college the entire time I was at community college, and they helped out pretty significantly when I was going to a private college. I actually walked out with, I think, $20,000 worth of debt. So for me personally, I only have to pay $150 a month for 10 years and I'm completely out of credit card debt or college debt, I mean. But this is where it started to become a little bit of an issue with my fiance's numbers. So pay-wise, I was the issue. Now we're getting into kind of credit and money we owe. And this is where we started to get into a little bit of trouble with her. Like I said, no credit card debt, absolutely fantastic. However, she took out her college loans in a little bit different way that definitely hurt us. So instead of taking out, you know, whatever loans you needed for an entire year. Hers are actually structured by semester. So, you know, for the spring semester, she took out a loan. For the fall semester, she took out a loan. And instead of doing the community college route, which saves you a ton of money, she decided to go to a private school for all four years, which is absolutely fine. It just means it costs a lot more money, obviously. And because she did loans by semester instead of by the year or by kind of the entire time she was there, all of her loans are separate. They're not consolidated into one payment. So she might owe $25 a month on this one, 50 on that one, 100 on that one. And when they're taking a look at debt to equity ratio, this gets very expensive very quickly because for me, it's only $150 a month. With her, we're looking at 500. And you know, that's one of those things where out where we live, people don't make a ton of money. So when you're taking out, you know, say 25% of what you're gonna make in a month, just going out to college loans, that doesn't include all the other essentials you're gonna have in life. So that really adds up and it kind of hurt our debt to equity ratio. And it made it pretty hard to actually get approved for a decent sized loan because we owed so much money per month just because of the way her college is structured. But we might talk about college structuring things a little bit later in a different video. I just want to give you guys a quick heads up. You know, we're going through the process. This is one of the issues we ran into. Now, the next thing is getting down to cars. And I definitely plan on making a video on buying versus leasing a car because this is something that I feel very strongly about. But basically, when we got down to that part of you know, the debt ratio, I had my car, I've been paying way, way ahead on it. 
I bought it in, I posted on Twitter the other day. I bought it a couple years ago. It's not actually due until 2019, but when I, we were taking a look at it and kind of our debt to equity, my payment was $265 a month. And we found out that it made our loan a hell of a lot cheaper and we'd qualify for a lot more if I just paid off the last $3,500 I owed on my car because that was a difference of, you know, $265 a month which again, when you're not making that much money, that's a pretty decent percentage of your income. So I was actually able to pay off the full 3,500 I still owed on my car. And again, I was already paid a year ahead or whatever, but in terms of debt to equity, that's a monthly payment that was still on kind of our bill, even though I was way ahead. So I paid my car off in full just to kind of help this number a little bit. And again, unfortunately, this is kind of a number that hurt us on her side because she leases her vehicle, she doesn't buy them. So she has a payment of $235 a month. And unfortunately, when you lease your vehicle, your payments never end. So, you know, I was able to just pay off my car and then I don't have payments until I decide, hey, I need a new car. She will have payments until she either buys herself a car or for the rest of time, she just decides to keep leasing vehicles. So that's one of those numbers that I was able to kind of influence a little bit by paying mine off. But again, unfortunately, on top of the college debt, we also had her car payment debt. So that really threw off our debt to equity ratio. And we really had to kind of find ways to move money around and pay off some of these debts so that it was a lot easier for us to actually get approved and get approved for a little bit more money towards a house. So now here comes the big one, right? How much money are we looking to borrow? They've run our credit. They've already checked our debt to equity ratio. Now it comes down to how much money are we looking to borrow? And then we'll figure out rates and things like that. Now, here's one area where I luck out a ton. I live out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, which means that there aren't very many great paying jobs, but it also means that the houses around here are dirt cheap compared to elsewhere. I mean, if I drove 20 minutes north, kind of where I work, houses around here that are $100,000 go for two, $300,000 up there. So the way it works, we're gonna get a pretty decent house relatively cheap. Now, another big advantage I have that honestly a lot of people won't is my dad is a world-class carpenter. He builds multi-million dollar houses and honestly, he's getting close to retirement age. So it's gonna work out for me that any kind of repairs or anything I want done with my house, I have to pay for parts and then throw a barbecue and hey dad, come down here and help me build this or help me you know, replace the flooring, help me fix this wall. So it's one huge advantage I have, but it also made it so we can go for a little bit cheaper of a house knowing that you know if we spent a little bit less money, we can invest the money we're gonna save and get a lot of great work done because most of the time when you're fixing your house, at least half the cost is in labor. And now I'm gonna get that at significantly reduced cost. So for us personally, the house we're looking at was actually owned by the lady who cut my hair. It's actually owned by her mother. So it's pretty nice for us, it's a family friend. So we're actually gonna put our offer in before it hits the market which means that we're not competing against anybody. There's no bidding war or anything like that going on. So for us personally, we're only borrowing $80,000. Now that's not such a bad number because you know, we'll go into kind of what that $80,000 entails, but that's a relatively small amount, which means our monthly payments are gonna be low, which means that we actually have money to reinvest and kind of fix up the house. Now it's a little bit older, it's from the 1950s and it's pretty dated on the inside. Maybe I'll put like a quick slideshow of some pictures at the end of this, I'm not sure. But basically, basically, that's how much money we're looking to borrow. We're looking at borrowing $80,000. So now we kind of get into what kind of rates and what kind of value we're looking at. Now, there's two different kinds of interest rates you can get when you're buying a house. The first one is gonna be fixed. So basically all fixed rate means if I sign a contract at 4% interest, then over the next 30 years, I'm simply charged at a flat 4% interest and that's how much my payments are. The second one is gonna be a variable interest. And this can change quite a bit in terms of, usually you start out a little bit lower. So maybe it starts out at three and a half percent instead of 4%, which seems like a great deal. However, it's variable, which means that after either the end of one year, five years, seven, 10, 15, however years is set up, it can go up. So maybe at the end of every year, it goes up a 10th of a percent. Well, that seems like a pretty bad deal now because you know halfway through the loan, maybe I'm paying a five or 6% interest which is absolutely gonna add up, that's a huge number. So it seems like fixed is always the way to go, just because it seems like it'd be a lot cheaper. But to be honest with you guys, we're going with a variable rate. 
and it's simply because of a special they have going on and the low dollar amount we're borrowing. So let me kind of pop up some numbers here, show you guys kind of the differences for us. And again, this is just from my personal experience. You can absolutely crunch the numbers and figure it out for yourself. But again, I'm just showing you guys our journey. So here's what it looks like. So we're showing you guys two different examples here from two different banks. So up first is at a 3.5% interest rate. So at 3.5% interest on a $75,000 loan, which I know I said 80,000, but because we have to put a down payment and stuff down, it actually becomes a little bit less than that. So at 3.5%, $75,000 over 30 years, we'd be paying $337 a month. And at the end of 30 years, we'd be paying $121,242. Now I wanted to mention this number because it's a huge shock value to a lot of people. You're only borrowing $75,000. How come you owe 121,000? And that's why these guys love putting out these loans, guys. You're gonna end up paying a 40 to 80% premium just on that you know, 3.5% times 30 years you pay a huge premium on these loans. And that's why we had that huge crash. A lot of these banks want to put out these loans because they make so much money. But then you have that issue when people start defaulting on these loans, then they start losing that crazy amount of money. So now that's if we pay off our house during that variable loan while it's at the lowest price point. So let me just show you guys real quickly what it would be if we went with that higher, the fixed rate. And I'll show you guys kind of those numbers. And then we'll go back and explain why I'm going with the variable. So basically, if we took out that same $75,000 at 4%, we'd be paying $358 a month. So about an extra $20 a month payment wise. And in the end, it would cost us about an extra $7,000. We're looking at $128,902. Now that's again, if we pay flat rate across on a 3.5 and a 4% loan. Now again, ours is variable, but it's variable in a way that's a little bit different than most places. So ours isn't gonna go up every month or every seven years. It's going up one time after year 15. So halfway through our loan, we, our interest rate would go up. Now here's the scary part. That interest loan can go up as much as two points. So it can go as from 3.5 points all the way up to 5.5, which means that if you're taking this kind of loan, you're very, very confident that you can pay it off well before it's supposed to be done. Now, Ryan Scribner put out a great video to show you guys that if you pay just an extra $100 a month, you can basically pay off your house in about 19 years. Now, if you do the math out on that, I'm not gonna pop it up here just because this video is gonna be long enough as it is, but basically we'd save a ton of money. So now let me go over the way that I personally plan on paying off this loan and showing you guys how much of a difference it's gonna make and why I decided to take this lower interest rate, even though it is variable, and if I don't pay it off this way, it can absolutely come back and bite me. So the way I'm looking at it is $75,000 at three and a half percent, but we're gonna pay it off in 15 years. So I'm still taking out a 30 year loan just in case you know something bad happens, but we're actually gonna pay it off in 15 years. And in the end, it's only gonna cost us $98,000. Now that is an absolute astronomical savings on this kind of loan. I mean, that's enough money to go out and buy another car if I need to. So. Again, you have to be very, very confident that you can pay it off before this variability goes up. Otherwise, absolutely, I always recommend taking that fixed rate. So that's gonna be the end of our first part here. I think this video is long enough, but basically I just wanted to cover your different options in terms of which banks you can go through, the actual credit scanning where they kind of go through and see what your debt to equity ratio is, how much money you can borrow. I wanted to give you guys a real example how much money we're borrowing. So again, about 75,000 after you make your down payments. And one thing I didn't touch on on this is that this doesn't include things like your house insurance, you're gonna have school taxes, things like that. I'm gonna roll that over into the video when we actually take out the loan, just because I think this video is gonna be long enough as is. And that's also a pretty basic understanding of the different interest rates. And again, fixed, usually a better option because we're buying a cheap house that's well within our means. I think personally going for the 15 year variable is a lot better option for us because even if I can't quite pay off the house in 15 years, the amount I'm going to save in that first 15 years just on half a percent interest is more than going to make up for any little bit of interest I'm going to have to pay, you know, if this goes 16, 17, 18 years. But anyways, guys, like I said, this video is long enough. We'll roll everything else into part two. So I hope this is helping you guys out and I will see you guys soon.